Hello, and welcome to the UW Clean Energy Institute's virtual lunch and learn event. We are excited to spend the next hour with you learning from UW graduate students about clean energy. My name is Sean Taylor, and I'm the Clean Energy Institute Education Director. While we join you virtually today, the presenters do their research at the University of Washington in Seattle. And as such, we'd like to acknowledge the Coast Salish peoples of this land, the land which touches the shared waters of all tribes and bands of the Suquamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot nations. Our first presenter today is Mitchell Kaiser. He's a chemist and his talk is titled, um, Building the Future with Molecular Legos. After he presents and answers your questions, Amy Stegman, a graduate student in molecular engineering, will discuss everyday life at the nanoscale and then take your questions. Finally, Dr. Phil Cox, a staff scientist at the Washington Clean Energy Test Beds, will do an electron microscope demonstration. During the presentations, you can post questions on slido.com with the code CEI underscore lunch and learn with no spaces. For those of you, you we have yet to meet, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the Clean Energy Institute. CEI was founded in 2013 with funds from the state of Washington. Our mission is to accelerate the adoption of a scalable clean energy future that'll improve the health and economy of our state, nation, and the world. To accomplish this, CEI supports the advancement of next generation solar energy, battery materials and devices, as well as the integration with systems and the grid. The Institute creates the ideas and educates the people needed to generate these innovations while facilitating the pathways to bring them to market. We have a robust K-12 education focused on getting students excited about clean energy and engineering. We work closely with teachers and nonprofit organizations in the region. We design lesson plans and our graduate students like Amy and Mitchell visit with classrooms to do demonstrations. Please visit our website to learn more about this work and the resources that we have to offer. And you can enroll in UW's at, U, uh, I'm sorry, UWCEI at UWEDU with any questions or requests. That's our email address. And with that, uh, I'll pass the virtual mic to Mitchell. Hey, everybody. And thanks, Sean, for the introduction. Uh, so for you, those of you just tuning in, uh, during our talk, you guys can go to this website here, slido.com, using our event code CEI underscore lunch and learn uh, to submit questions that we'll answer during our question and answer uh, sessions after each presentation. So a little bit about me. Um, as mentioned, I'm a third year PhD student in the Department of Chemistry here at the University of Washington. Um, and I work under a PI actually, who is a faculty member in the Department of Material Science and Engineering. So oftentimes in, in, uh, in science in the university level, we have a lot of different people who are experts in different subjects working together. Uh, my current research is focused on understanding the interaction between molecules and two dimensional materials. I was born in Vancouver, Washington, where I lived until I moved to Seattle in 2014 to start my undergraduate education uh, right here at UW. And I was inspired to pursue science by visiting uh, OMSI, which is the Oregon Museum of Science and Industry when I was young. Um, and in my free time, I love to hike. I like to bike, backpack uh, and kayak and really be outside in, in any way. Um, and I also really love to make art and I'm an amateur blacksmith. So the title of my talk today is Plenty of Room at the Bottom, Building the Future with Molecular Legos. So the big idea I want to sort of express here today is that we're going to be thinking of ways that we can mix the right pieces together so that they'll actually build themselves into useful structures. So we don't have to put them there. They'll just automatically come together in a way that, that we can design beforehand. And so our building blocks are going to be molecules. We can think of these as our smaller Lego stud pieces here, two dimensional materials, which are sort of like these big flat Lego base pieces. And then we can think about them coming together to make all sorts of structures like shown here. 
And I'll talk a little bit more about what each of these uh, categories is in just a minute. So to start, I'd like to talk a little bit about the nature of matter. So I'm sure a lot of you know that the matter we interact with on a daily basis is made up of atoms. And atoms, of course, can bond together to make molecules. So here's a little anatomy of an atom for you guys here. We have the nucleus of the atom that's made up of neutrons, which are neutrally charged, and we have protons that are positively charged. Now, protons are actually the part of the atom that gives it its identity as an element. So an element is something like helium, in this case, or iron, um, nickel, hydrogen, sodium. Um, and then around the nucleus, we have negatively par charged particles that orbit called electrons. And electrons are responsible for uh, atoms coming together to form bonds and also in interacting and reacting with each other. And to give you a little sense of scale here, um, this helium atom here, we can actually fit 5 million of them on the head, just the head of a pin, like shown here. So they're very, very small. And so, as I said, uh, atoms can bond together to form molecules. Here is an example of a water molecule. Of course, everybody's really familiar with this, which is two hydrogen atoms that are bound to this oxygen atom here. So moving up uh, the ladder in the scale of materials, the next thing to think about is solids. And so there are all kinds of solids that we can form out of atoms and molecules. So particularly, I'm going to talk to you guys about crystals. And what makes crystals special is that they're structures made from atoms and molecules that have really regular, so that means they have repeating shapes that have the same pattern, and they have something that's called translational invariance. And what this means is if I take this part of the crystal, for example, and I move it over here, then you can't tell the difference between here and here. They're exactly identical, just under moving the pieces around. So there are all kinds of different crystals here. And the ones that I'm gonna to talk to you about today are a special kind of covalent network crystal. And a covalent network just means that all of the atoms in this crystal are bound together by sharing their electrons equally. And in this special kind of covalent network crystal, the atoms are actually bound together in these layers and these layers are just held together by very weak forces. I also wanna make sure that we all are on the same page by what I mean about dimensionality. So you guys, I'm sure, are all very familiar with this sort of x, y, z plot, where each of these axes just represents a direction in space. So then on this plot, if I talk about zero dimensions, I just mean one point. Then if I think about one dimensions, then I mean we take a line and we draw it in one axis in any direction, it doesn't matter, but it's just a single line that's one dimensional. Now, if we go down and extend our line to give it a width and a height, suddenly we have a two dimensional shape, in this case, a square. And finally, if we add one di more dimension, so we're in the third dimension, we have a cube that has a height, a width, and a depth. And similarly, we can see these uh, these dimensions in, in, uh, in substances that we see that are made up of atoms. For example, this is a molecule called a fullerene, and it's zero dimensional, meaning it doesn't have any substantial height, width, or depth. And it's sort of like just a single stud of Legos. We also can form these things called nanotubes, which are made up of atoms bound together, and they're very long, but they don't have any height or depth. So it's sort of just like this long Lego piece here. The next step up is two-dimensional materials. In this case, this is what's called graphene. It's made up of carbon atoms all bound up together. And it's like a single sheet of paper. So it has a width and a depth, but it doesn't have any height. So it's like this flat Lego uh, base piece here. Finally, we have three-dimensional materials, of course, which can be all bound up together tightly this is carbon in 
uh, structure that's in diamonds. So this is very hard. And that's because all of these carbon atoms are bound together. This is graphite, which is made up of these graphene sheets. Graphite is like what's in your pencil. And because it is only weak, these sheets are only weakly bound together, it's soft enough that you can write on it and leave behind a trail on a piece of paper. So that's sort of like these thicker Lego blocks here. So, okay, I've told you guys what two-dimensional materials are, and now how do we get them? So it's actually pretty easy to get them. So like I said, for instance, if we're thinking about the graphite in your pencil, it's made up of all of these sheets of atoms that are bound together. And we can actually just peel them apart by taking a piece of scotch tape like you use every day, and we can peel off those layers, layer by layer, until finally we get just a single layer. So here's a picture of somebody actually peeling apart graphite. And then here's an image that is taken with this microscope here that just has a lens that magnifies uh, what we look at. So we can see just a single layer of that graphite. And actually right down here is the picture that I took using this kind of microscope. And this is a material called molybdenum disulfide. I'll show you what this looks like a little later, but you can see that these really faint areas right here are just a single layer of this crystal. And then as they get sort of darker, we can see this is probably two layers, three layers, a couple more layers, and then we get into so many layers that it's no longer transparent. So I said that we're going to take these materials and we're going to somehow make them so that they build themselves into a shape that we want. And so this is something called self-assembly, which is where we can make these complex structures of various materials just by choosing the right ingredients and we mix them. So sort of shown in this cartoon here is if we imagine this is our two-dimensional material and we have molecules that come and they set down in this arrangement all on their own and build together into these large layers. So this is kind of like if I put all of these different Lego pieces into this bowl here, I mix them up, and then all on their own, they build themselves together into a, a structure that we choose. So I talked to you guys before about this picture here. This is molybdenum disulfide, which is shown in this uh, cartoon of the crystal here. So we have our a row of molybdenum atoms and on either side we have sulfur. So that's what this is here. And then what I'm showing you in this image is I've taken this molybdenum and I've covered it in a solution of this molecule here which is called triphenyl arsine. And the triphenyl arsine has set down on top of the molybdenum to form a structure all on its own. And this is actually what's called a scanning tunneling microscopy image. So we use electrons because uh, these molecules are so small, we need small particles to see them. And in fact, Amy's gonna talk to you a little more about this later. But what we can see is that these are the sort of triangular shapes of these molecules lining up in these nice patterns all on their own on this surface. And even more interestingly, we can actually start to build things like wires onto these surfaces. So these wires are made up of these pieces called nanorods. This is a gold that's in a very, very small rod shape and different molecules. And they form these nice wires all on their own. And these are very, very small. So if you imagine that this scale bar here is one micrometer, which means it's one millionth of the size of like the pencil head on, or the eraser on your pencil head is what we're looking at right here, or one one hundred thousand of that size. So now you might wonder, well, why do we even care about this? Why is this interesting? And so we can actually do all kinds of really exciting things with electronics that we wouldn't be able to do before with this knowledge. So we can think about making really, really small electronics because we're using, instead of larger electronic parts, we're using molecules to carry out those functions. So 
for instance, this is a computer that was made by IBM right here. This is, this is a computer. This is not a smudge on the screen, this little particle right here. And it's laid on top of this pile of salt. So you can see exactly how small this is. And so this is currently the smallest computer we can make. And we can even make smaller computers using this uh, method of self-assembly that I described to you guys. We can also think about making things like this concept for a smartwatch, where inside of this watch, there's a pullout screen that's flexible and transparent. And then you can use this screen like a smartphone screen where you can touch and interact with the display. And so by using these two dimensional materials, which are very strong and flexible and putting the right mo molecules as electronic components, we could make this sort of transparent, flexible display possible. Finally, here is an image of something called a biosensor. So this would be like, a, a, you can imagine a Band-Aid that you wear on your skin, but instead of using it to cover a wound, it's actually sensing molecules on your skin and it can tell you about illnesses that you might have and you can get really quick information about sickness this way. These materials also are very exciting for clean energy. Of course, this is the Clean Energy Institute, so that's exciting to us. We can, uh, or this method of building things by self-assembly is much less wasteful and energy intensive than the ways we currently make electronic components. So when we build electronics, take for instance, the micros, microchip in your phone, we have to mine the metal, which takes a lot of energy and also is destructive to the earth. We have to etch the circuit boards, which use acids that are very hazardous to dispose of. And it also just takes a lot of power. Whereas if we're thinking about self-assembly, we're using much smaller amounts of material. And because the components are coming together all on their own, it requires less power and just a smaller volume of materials. So one example of something we can make is solar panels. Of course, we all know that the energy from the sun that we can harvest is free and it also has absolutely no emissions to generate electricity this way and we can even make flexible solar panels so these could go for instance on a window in your car and if we use two-dimensional materials and molecules they can be transparent so you can see through them even while the window on your car is generating electricity there are also structures we can make that are used for producing hydrogen. So, so we would immerse this structure in water and it would react with the water to produce a gas called hydrogen. And hydrogen is something I'm particularly excited about because we can use it as a fuel. And when we use hydrogen as a fuel, it reacts with oxygen gas, which is the gas, of course, that we breathe every day. And through this reaction, if we put it in a car, all we produce is an emission instead of carbon dioxide, which I'm sure you all know is a major contributor to climate change. All that comes out is water vapor. And we can also further enable this idea by the use of two-dimensional two materials and molecules by using them to create better fuel cells, which is where the oxygen and the hydrogen react together, and also to store hydrogen in a, in, in a more efficient way. So I'd like to thank you all for your attention and at this time and invite any questions you might have. Thank you. So we do have one question. Uh, so are the molecules kind of like magnets in the way they just come together? Right, you can think of it exactly like that. Molecules have, the electrons in molecules act like magnets where they're hold, held together by forces of opposite charges. So yes, yeah, just like magnets. So that's all the questions from the audience, but I have one. Um, if you could succeed in making a super tiny electronics, let's say a little radio or something that's the size of that little pinhead that you showed us, don't you still have to connect it to big old wires to go to batteries and to go to screens? So how do you 
how do you go between something at the, a nano scale to something that's a wire that you can actually plug into something? Uh, of course. So we, when we make these really small components, of course, like Sean mentioned, it is hard to connect them to, to larger components. And so we sort of have to build every component into our device. So that means some kind of power storage and also some kind of antenna for instance, if we make a tiny computer, then an antenna that can communicate with the screen so we can take that computer and project an image onto a screen. That's really great. Um, I'll wait a little bit more for any other questions. Um, I, I wanted to compliment you on your, your uh, video with the stirring the Legos in the <laughs> water and then having thank you, it thank magically you. self assemble. That was tricky. That's the uh, the extent of my video editing talent. So I hope everybody enjoyed that. <laughs> okay, here's a question. How does that watch that pulls out a two dimensional thing work? Uh, okay, so we're talking about this watch here. So basically, the way that we would make this is we would have uh, some kind of basically like a plastic, first of all, to act as the main structure of this watch, like a thin plastic, like, um, for example, uh, the packaging that a lot of uh, products comes in, you know, that plastic's sort of flexible. So we'd have that, and that could roll up using kind of a spring in, in this actual metal band here. And then on this plastic, we would deposit our two-dimensional materials and then on top of that, we could lay down molecular layers to act as the rest of the electronic components. Great. Um, we're almost out of time. There was one more question. How, how do you manage to make the teeny tiny computer? What did you use? So I, I didn't make this personally. This was made by IBM. But basically what they do is they deposit layers of materials by by evaporating them. So they heat, heat up whatever material they want to put down and then they deposit it on a surface. They put down basically a mask on that surface. So they, if you imagine, it's like uh, almost like a spray paint stencil. So you put the stencil on the surface and then you put on a chemical that removes what you don't want to lay down on that layer. And so you could be left with, for example, wires or um, uh, LEDs in that layer, and then you do this method over and over and over again to stack up components until you make a computer. Great. Well, that's all the time we have for Mitchell, and thank you for the questions from the audience. And thank you, Mitchell. That was a great little presentation for us about of course. nano self-assembly. Um, now Amy can join us. Amy Stegman, and uh, she's going to talk about everyday life at the nanoscale. Right, and I'd just like to start by reminding anyone who's late to join or just joining recently, uh, if you have questions, you can go to slido.com, uh, enter our event code, CEI Lunch and Learn, and then um, we'll have a moderated question session after the end of this talk. So um, I'd like to introduce myself a little bit more. Um, and um, say I'm from North Seattle Community College. Uh, that's where I started my college education. And then I transferred to UW and I got um, an undergraduate degree in materials science engineering here. Then uh, I actually stayed here for my PhD and I'm a third year student in molecular engineering. Um, I got into science when I was taking a biology class. Uh, the first time that I looked through a microscope and I could see things that were so much smaller than I could see with my eye. And it, it was just such a, a magical experience that um, it really inspired me to learn as much as I could. Um, I love the idea of looking at molecules and atoms to see how they grow so that we can learn how to control them. And this is really important for uh, clean energy. 
energy. Part of why controlling the atoms is important is because, well, when we started, we had huge computers that took up a whole room uh, in around 1950s. And now we have these tiny computers with so many components that Mitchell showed you that fit on a grain of sand. Uh, we're at about the limit for size, like we're now limited by atoms. So if we wanna keep making our computers better and better, we have to build them better, more efficient in, in better controlled ways. So that's what I'm studying. And I design proteins to control how the crystals grow. Uh, what are proteins, you might ask? Well, we've probably all heard of that when we eat, where we want proteins and vegetables, but your bodies are all actually made out of proteins. Um, they control making more proteins, giving you blood or oxygen through your blood, uh, energy to move. They protect us from sickness and even viruses are made out of protein. So it's this huge class of molecules that nature has designed that make all these very different structures. And how do they make these different structures? Well, each protein is sort of like a chain of, uh, like of pearls even. And if you think of each pearl as an amino acid, then these are all slightly different molecules they're strung together in a chain. And those weak forces that um, Mitchell was explaining that go in between molecules make them fold into these very different shapes. So I'm taking advantage of that. Um, here's a protein that I've designed by controlling the sequence of amino acids. And right here, um, that actually go all the way around the center uh, I've controlled, I've, I've created these amino acids that are special to create a place for crystals to grow. So what I imagine is going to happen is I'm going to grow crystals right around the center of this in the shape of kind of a donut. Um, now I want to talk about the size, 10 nanometers. Maybe you know exactly what's 10 nanometers, but I want to just stress different sizes. So people are on the meter size, like I'm a little bit taller than a meter, and then 10 times smaller than me would be an ostrich egg, and then 100 times smaller than an ostrich egg is a frog egg. And if we look 10 times smaller than that, we have right here at 100 micrometers, that's about this width of a human hair. And that's also about as small as we can see with our eyes. So if we wanna see things that are much smaller than 100 micrometers, well, how would we do that? We might use light. You've maybe seen an, a microscope that uses light. And the way that this works is we have a light source it goes through lenses and through your sample and more lenses and we get a magnified image maybe up to a thousand times magnified so that lets us see a whole lot more with than we can see with our eyes we can get down maybe to 100 nanometers this lets us see some really interesting things like plant cells and animal cells and bacteria but if we wanted to see something even smaller, like the flu virus or the coronavirus, which is our current pandemic, um, we need to come up with another solution. We have a hard limit right here at about 100 nanometers. And the reason for this, it has to do with light itself. Did you know that light has a size? It travels in waves and the size of those waves goes from about 650 nanometers for red down to about 400 nanometers for, for violet. And so if we are wanting to look at things much smaller than these wavelengths, we run into some problems. You can imagine this like trying to put together Legos with an oven mitt. You're 
you, you can put things that are a little bit smaller than the oven mitt together, but if you wanted to go to the smaller blocks, you would really be wanting smaller hands. So we use particles that are smaller than light. And what we use are electrons. Electrons are part of an atom, but they're even smaller than atoms. So we can use electrons to look directly at atoms, which are the smallest building block, to lipids, proteins that I study, and viruses. So um, electron microscopy is a big focus of my PhD work. And what does an electron microscope look like? Well, it's huge for one. The, the uh, column that you have in a light microscope is about as tall as a room. And this is a very specialized instrument. It lets us magnify about um, a million times, but it works very similarly. So we still have lenses and we still have our sample that we shine our beam through. And then we can see up to, um, up to a million times larger. And this lets us see atoms. But we're much smaller than light and colors come from light. So what would an electron image look like? Well, notice here it's in black and white because um, we're smaller than colors and it doesn't make sense to, to give this a color. So we just have where we can have the electrons shine through and where they're blocked. So here's an image that I've taken of a crystal. And uh, here you can see these black dots that are arranged in rows are actually atoms that are blocking the electron beam. And this lets us study how the atoms are spaced, how how they start to grow, how we have a change here from where they started to where they grow. And by controlling how they grow, we want to make better electronics. So um, this is not made with a protein. Let's talk about what I've currently been focusing on. And here, if you remember my little dog bell, uh, uh, dog bone shaped proteins, we have an electron image of what these look like. And they um, are kind of cute. Um, but remember in the previous slide, the dark spots were the atoms of our crystal. Here, the light spots are my protein. And this is because the molecules, the atoms that make up my protein are so uh, light that even they are hard to see with an electron microscope. So what I've done is I've used staining to make the background dark. So now I can see the proteins. And this is kind of one of the main challenges that I'm facing in my science because I need to make the proteins visible at the same time as my crystals. So if I look without the stain, after I've had them grow crystals, it's difficult to interpret. So here, maybe we have the crystal spots that I've grown. And I think maybe we're looking at protein bits. Maybe this is a dog bone with titania, but maybe is not really enough to share with other scientists yet. Um, so that we have more studies that we need to do, but very promising when I don't stain and I look at about a million times magnified, I see these very small little crystals that have been grown presumably by my protein. So now um, this is pretty exciting. I've, I'm, I'm getting some results in my science. Um, I'm helping with clean energy by uh, understanding how we grow crystals and um, the way that science works, we repeat many times to make sure that it's not 
because there was too much rain in the air that day that it grew um, or other crazy variables that we haven't designed. Um, and then we test a lot. So just showing an image with crystals and saying, hey, I made them isn't quite enough. What I'm gonna be doing in the next months is uh, looking at them more times and then looking at other instruments to make sure that these, these are the crystals that I meant to make and that they were made by my proteins. Um, and that's how we progress science. And with that, I'd like to ask for any questions. Thanks, Amy. <clears throat> right now, I, I, there's no questions yet. I had a question. Uh, how do you make a protein? How do you make a protein? I know how the body makes them, but. Yeah, that's a great question. I'm going to go back to this slide. Right, so when we sequence different proteins, um, here we have amino acids that are our building block. And how do we say, cool, I want this particular sequence and I want it um, put together and then to fold. So we take advantage of the um, evolved machinery that nature already has because our bodies are constantly making protein. We actually use E. coli and we sequence DNA. So we start with DNA and then we put the DNA into the, the bacteria for us and, and, and have the bacteria create the, the protein. Actually this slide, here we have it, the, the bacteria has many little proteins in it like this ribosome. So this takes the DNA that we put in and the, and the RNA polymerase. So if we start with DNA, the bacteria makes RNA and then it uses RNA like, like a computer code to create our protein. And that is in sort of a pearl strand. And then based on how we've designed it, it folds into what the, the shape that we define. Like this, this protein that we've defined based on um, mechanical properties that we want would have no function in our body. Um, I, guess I, I guess the question somebody was gonna ask uh, but it was the same question. How do you develop a protein? What technology do you use? And how do you know how to make it good? Yeah. Okay. So how do we know how to make it good? There are so many labs around the world who are working on designing proteins. And it started maybe 10 or 15 years ago when we started saying, cool, what do we know about proteins? And we put all that knowledge into a program called Rosetta. And we use that program to uh, um, predict how it's going to fold. So we have a structure that we want to make and we use computer processing to help us come up with a sequence of amino acids that's likely to fold into what we want. And then we order a lot more than just one design there's probably um, in the end, maybe 50 possibilities. So we take the best and we try them. And, and there is a lot of trial and error to get to a protein that is shaped exactly how we want it. That's fantastic. Um, you really are a, a protein engineer. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think that's the end of our questions. So um, thank you, Amy. And we will now shift to uh, Dr. Philip Cox. And um, uh, Dr. Philip Cox is a University of Washington graduate 
where he earned his PhD studying how organic solar cells work at the nanoscale. He's now a senior staff scientist at the Washington Clean Energy Test Beds, where he gets to work with a lot of fun of equipment and help researchers from all over the world develop clean energy technologies. And um, this is a special uh, experiment for us because we are going to connect right to uh, Dr. Cox's electron microscope, a desktop electron microscope over uh, on another part of campus. And you'll get to see some amazing things on a portable microscope. All right, thanks, Sean. Uh, so yeah, so as Sean was saying, uh, I'm here at a laboratory at University of Washington. It's called the Washington Clean Energy Test Beds. And currently I'm sitting in our analysis room where we have a lot of really nice fancy equipment that allows us to look at the materials uh, that we use primarily for making solar and battery materials and other related clean energy technologies. Um, today, we will be looking at our scanning electron microscope. So I have this set up to do a live demo today. And sort of contrary to the SEM that Amy showed in her presentation, this one is quite a bit smaller. This is known as a, a desktop or a benchtop SEM. And while it's not quite as powerful as a lot of other SEMs or the larger SEMs like the one Amy showed, um, it's extremely fast at what it does. So it allows me to put in a large number of samples very quickly and get out the data I need uh, at a much more rapid pace. So let's now, I'll start the screen share for the SEM and we're gonna take a look at just some fun stuff, um, some everyday items that everybody should be very familiar with and see what they look like under a microscope. Okay, so to start off, we are looking at a regular optical microscope view of three different materials that I have prepared here. Um, an optical microscope, like Amy was saying in her presentation, uses light to image just like a camera does. And just to give you an idea of sort of the limitations of using light for microscopy, let me zoom in on this center sample here. This is woven fabric that I took from a, uh, a t-shirt. And as I zoom in here, you start to make out little individual fibers. And they're all woven together in this sort of weave pattern. Now this is as far as I can go in on our regular light microscope. And I don't get a whole lot of information here. I can't really quite count individual fibers if I wanted to. And I certainly can't see uh, the roughness or, or, or surface structure of the fibers either. And to further demonstrate that, on the left-hand side, I have salt crystals. So this is just regular table salt. Um, same stuff you put on your dinner. And salt has this really cool cube-like crystal structure. Uh, and if I zoom in with the regular microscope, pretty much all I see is that they're just cubes. I can't really make out anything more than that. So now let's switch over to the electron microscope and see what we find. It takes just a few moments to switch over to the electron beam. Um, as Amy was describing, you're actually accelerating electrons towards the sample. Some of them go through the sample and the ones that are reflected or dislodged get detected by a detector. And that's how we get our image. So this here, this is the woven fabric. Let me try and uh, get this a little bit more clear by changing the focus. Okay, so now we can see 
all the tiny little fibers that make up the fabric. If I zoom out a little bit, you can see the weave pattern. So you've got groupings of fibers and they're all weaved over and under each other to make a t-shirt or whatever uh, the fabric is used for. Now, uh, if you've ever heard of thread count, say if you're looking for bed sheets or something, uh, the higher the thread count, generally the softer fabric is. And thread count is simply the number of fibers per square inch. So this is way smaller than a square inch, but if you were actually count up all of these individual fibers over an area of one inch, that's how you would get that thread count number. Now let's go check out the salt. So as I was saying, the salt has this really neat cube-like crystal structure. And now that we're on the electron microscope, I can zoom in quite a bit further and I can start to make out, as I focus a little better, all these uh, little rough textural features on the surface of the salt. And this is not something that you'd be able to see at all with a regular white light microscope. Now, this scale bar down here on the lower left, if you can see that, it says 30 micrometers, a micron, is what we call it for short, is one millionth of a meter. And 50 microns is about the width of a human hair. So this image here is say roughly about the width of a human hair that we're looking at right now. All right, so salt, cube-like crystals. What about sugar? Sugar is very similar to white powder. I've got sugar over on the right hand side here, and it's quite a bit different looking. The crystals in sugar form these almost gem like structures that look like little trapezoidal prisms. And again, if we zoom far in, you'll start to see these rough textures on the sugar surface. Now, you may see these little, uh, these little black pieces forming. That is very likely the electrons damaging the surface of the sugar and actually ripping them apart. So I'm gonna zoom back out, to make sure we don't keep doing that. Okay, so those are some everyday objects. I would also like to switch over to a different sample. And this case, I have, let's see, here's my camera. I have a small piece of a silicon solar cell. So you may have heard of solar cells. Solar cells take sunlight, they capture the light, and they turn it into electricity. And I thought it would be cool to take a look at one since that's um, a major part of what we study here at the lab. And I've removed the sample cup from the SEM, looks like this. This was my little sample containing the fiber and salt and sugar crystals. And then I'm gonna put the solar sample on and adjust it so that it's at the right height. Insert it into the SEM. And here's our solar cell. So the interesting thing here is on the light, or the light microscope that's using light, everything looks very flat. These little lines, these are actually silver lines, are really nice and uniform looking, straight, perfect looking coatings of silver. Now, this bluer area, the larger blue area, that's the area composed of silicon, and that's the area that absorbs sunlight converts it into electricity. And then as that electricity is formed, it's shuttled over to these lines of silver. And you can kind of think of these lines of silver as like highways for electric current. And all the electric current gets shuttled out along these lines to whatever device you're powering 
whether you're charging a battery or powering your phone or something like that. But on the light microscope, everything looks very smooth and flat and perfect. So let's take a look with the electron microscope and see if it looks a little different. Just a moment. Okay. Now let me clean this up by zooming in and I'm going to optimize the focus. Okay. Now, this big structure here, that's the lines of silver. And they're quite a bit rough looking compared to when we were looking at on the light microscope. Um, and same with the silicon that's used or the, the layer that's used for absorbing sunlight. That's all of this structure here. And it's quite rough. There's lots of little boundaries and um, these have some type of roughness and, and texture to them. And that's actually by design a lot of silicon solar cells will have a what's called an anti-reflection coating and that's to prevent a shiny surface from reflecting the very light that you want to capture to turn into electricity so when you have this sort of roughened surface structure that causes light to not just reflect off like a shining mirror or something like that and that enables the solar cell to better capture the sunlight that it needs to do its job and then what also is interesting is those really nice looking shuttles, uh, electric current shuttles made of silver are really uh, not as clean looking as you would expect by looking at eye, at it by eye or even under the light microscope. There's all sorts of little pockets and, and irregularities. And this is precisely why we use tools like this um, because we can better understand at the same level that the atoms in the solar cell or the silver are doing their job, we can actually see maybe why it's not working as well as it should, or if there's any defects or impurities. Uh, and we can better understand maybe why the solar cell is working really well or isn't working really well, and that there's room for improvement in the manufacturing process or the design, etc. Okay, so now last, I want to take a look at something really fun and kind of gross. We're going to look at a, well, it's really hard to see on my phone, but we're going to look at a spider. Spiders have really crazy looking legs and everything. And on the electron microscope, you can really see it in gross detail. So. I'm going to again remove the solar sample and now I've got my spider and don't worry I did not kill the spider myself I found it dead in the lab and we're going to lower it again just like the other sample put it in the SEM And here you go, here's my big ugly spider. Pretty gross looking. Um, with the white light microscope, you can see there are some hairy looking legs here, but kind of not easy to make out necessarily. So let's switch over to the electron microscope and see what that looks like.
Okay, so here is a spider leg. I'm going to uh, enhance the focus a little bit. So it seems like it's already pretty good. Yeah, I think that's about as good as it's gonna get. Okay. So this is a spider leg. There's a bunch of hairs. There's little pieces of dirt and whatever all over it. Because even if we zoom further in, you can kind of see like a hair follicle of a hair that's broken off. Uh, and little cracks maybe in the features of the spider here. And then let's check out, I believe this area is the egg sac of the spider, which is especially hairy and kind of gross looking. It's got all that's, these folds of skin and everything. That's super cool. Now, Phil. And as we zoom in, you can actually make out this sort of ripply textural type of tissue that makes up the sac for the spider. And then you've got, of course, these little hair follicles with the hair growing out. Hey, Phil, we have questions from the audience. OK. Um, and actually, Amy and Mitchell, you can come on too. And we can, anybody who has questions for all of our, our speakers can ask them now. Why are the silver lines on the solar panels so rough the closer you zoom in? Uh, why are they just naturally smoothish? So when you construct these materials, they're, and, and as you look at things closer and closer up, they're not as perfect as your eye makes them out to be. Everything has a very fine structure, morphology, texture to it. And your eyes may not be able to see it because they just can't see the structure that small. But when you have a tool like a scanning electron microscope, now you can make out the texture and structure of those materials, uh, no matter how small they might be. And so during a manufacturing process for making solar cells, uh, you're transferring silver, whether it's by a coating method or a printing method, or by evaporation of the materials. And so the atoms and molecules are actually building up on the surface. And so the only way you would get a structure to be smoother is if you were able to polish it in some way. And generally polished structures that you see with your own eye that look very smooth are polished just on that scale. Like, you know, you, you think it's smooth, but if you were to put it under a microscope, it's probably not as smooth as it seems. So another question uh, under the microscope, how come the objects appear in different colors depending on how close you zoom in on it? Uh, so do we mean on the white light microscope or on the scanning I electron think, microscope? I think they mean the uh, optical microscope. Uh, well, the optical microscope actually has color to it because it's using visible light to capture the image and visible light is what gives rise to colors. Um, you might be seeing the effects of the brightness of the light too on shiny surfaces or something. Um, the light reflects better and so it might look whiter. And in like a shadowy area, it might look darker because the light's just simply being shadowed in that area. Um, to me, you know, I'm not seeing necessarily big color changes, but I'm seeing the focus of the image change significantly. So right now, you know, I'm focused on the top surface here of the spider. But if I zoom down now, okay, now I'm focused on these lower features, like the little pincers here at the, at the front of the spider. And then this kind of shiny area here is just where the light is reflecting really well. So I can actually roll off the brightness and that'll change the relative darkness or brightness of what I'm seeing. I think we have time for one more question and then we got to tune out. What kind of microscopes are there? There are a ton of different microscopes. Um, in general, they use either 
it, microscopes vary by the particle or light that they use to probe the materials. And they also vary by the way in which they use those particles or, or, or light to probe the materials. Um, I wouldn't even begin to be able to give you a, a full list of microscopes, but you know, a short list would be like an optical microscope that uses regular visible light. Uh, then there's like the one we're using today, a scanning electron microscope, which uses electrons to look at the surface of materials. You have scanning tunneling microscopy, which also uses electrons, uh, transmission electron microscopy, which also uses electrons. Electrons are very good for imaging things because they can see things that are extremely small. And the way those microscopes differ is in their function, how they use the electrons to interact with the material. That's so cool. Well, thanks, Phil. Thanks, Amy. Thanks, Corin. I mean, sorry, um, Mitchell. And thanks, Corin, for running. He's our, our uh, sound guy who is making all the electronics work on this program. Um, I hope you've enjoyed our presentations today and have gotten some views of what scientists do and some of the tools they use. And uh, we will see you next time. Thanks, everybody. And bye-bye. <laughs>